He was a perfectionist and had a wonderful eye for detail. His many paintings of Morecambe, Heesham and the surrounding area captured an accurate picture of a bygone age. Welcome to 100 Years, 100 Objects, stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums. My name is Rachel Roberts and I'm the Collections Registrar for Lancaster City Museums. In this series, we're celebrating 100 years of our museums by looking in depth at 100 of our favourite objects and the stories that they can tell. Today's object gives us a window into the life of a prolific local artist. To learn more about him, we start with a picture of the place that he lived. Today's object is an image of Auburn, home of William Woodhouse. The picture is a watercolour, although Woodhouse also worked in oils. It's quite small, at just 26 centimetres by 18 centimetres. The image shows Auburn, where the artist lived with his family. The house is stone, with a red-tiled roof, areas of black and white mock Tudor design, and a white porch. A dusty coloured road runs in front of the house, down which a shepherd and his dog are herding a group of sheep. In the background can be seen the Church of St John the Divine, which for people from the area identifies this as what is now Furness Road in Heesham, although other than the church it looks very different today. We spoke to Paul Thompson, retired member of staff for Lancaster City Museums, who has worked with and loved the paintings of Woodhouse for many years, and knew his daughter Winnie well. He started by telling us a little bit about who William was, and why he chose this painting as his object to talk about today. Well, I worked at Lancaster Museum for nearly 40 years, looking at and handling William's paintings quite regularly. I consider them like old friends. I was born and brought up in Morecambe in the 50s and 60s and saw the tail end of many of the scenes that William captured in his paintings. I chose this small, unassuming watercolour of Auburn, which was Woodhouse's home from 1902 until he died in 1939, because it was a privilege to visit Auburn many times and I have some wonderfully happy memories of being in the house with William's son and daughter, Roy and Winnie. William Woodhouse was an artist born in 1857 in Morecambe Street, Portly Sands. Portly Sands was one of the villages that merged to make up Morecambe. He was the third child but first son of James and Hannah Woodhouse. Life would have been hard growing up in a poor fishing village and William never forgot his roots and later did many paintings of the local fishermen and their shrimping, cockling and the local fishing boats. His love for the bay was obvious. He was educated at the local national school in Polton where his talent for drawing was encouraged and he went on to attend classes at the Mechanics Institute in Lancaster. He would walk probably five miles there and five miles back on many a cold and wet night. A passion for painting and sketching animals grew along with his reputation as an artist. He rented a studio around the corner from their family home on Queen Street. He was often seen at the nearby blacksmiths, the local knacker's yard and Heesham Sham Depot where they stable the horses, sketching and studying the animals' anatomy. There are lovely examples of this skill of capturing horses in the museum collection with majestic and stable companions and army horses at their stables. In fact his last painting was of a horse in the blacksmith's yard. William married Maria Elizabeth Emsley, a Yorkshire lass, in 1892. They later moved to Morecambe and are listed as confectioners on Yorkshire Street in Morecambe. They moved into a house that William had designed and had built named Kennelcote on Chatsworth Road in Morecambe. It was a very desirable area close to the Morecambe Summer Gardens, now what's known as the Regent Park area. The Summer Gardens was an outdoor leisure venue as opposed to the Winter Gardens Theatre. His three children, Harold, who sadly died at three months old, Marie Winifred and Ronald, were all born there. It appears that William was something of a Victorian father and left the childcare to his wife Maria, while William concentrated on his painting in his studio at the far end of the garden. That combined with his other passion as a keen game hunter. There are photographs of his trophies, animal heads, adorning the walls of the house. By the turn of the century, the summer gardens had been demolished for building land and Kennelcote was surrounded by houses and more of an expanding population. So the family moved to the quieter, more rural area of Heesham, Auburn Court on Furness Road, and this was to be the family home until Winnie's death in 1996. Maria, William's wife, died in 1925 at the age of 60 after a long illness. 
and when he took over the role as housekeeper, as William continued his painting, he died suddenly 14 years later, at the age of 81, in 1939. Next, we wanted to delve deeper into Woodhouse as an artist, and find out if he always painted the local area, or whether his life took him further afield. Although probably best known for his animal and bird paintings, William was a prolific painter, and more than competent at most subjects. He obviously had a love for the countryside, but in Victorian times, values were very different from ours today. Hunting and shooting birds and animals was a sporting pastime for a gentleman. William would go on many shoots around the area, up as far as Scotland. This group of wealthy landowners were a ready market for his paintings, and often commissioned paintings of shoots, hunts, horses and gun dogs. Often, his game paintings included his own faithful dogs that were always by his side, Jess and Turk. One of them was black and one of them was white, but I can never remember which was which. He was a perfectionist and had a wonderful eye for detail. He would meticulously make many sketches before composing his paintings. His many paintings of Morecambe Heesham and the surrounding area captured an accurate picture of a bygone age. He was also a very talented portrait painter and has left behind many paintings of his family members and those of some of Morecambe's most affluent families. William was very much a home bird and he didn't really court fame or fortune. He did have a bit of an eye for the exotic though and is known to have visited the Buffalo Bill Wild West show but it did seem completely out of character that at the age of 32 in 1889 he went on a Near East tour with two companions, Crockford and Nelson. They set sail from Cardiff aboard the Moss Brow, heading for Constantinople, now Istanbul. The trip is well documented, both in his artworks and a comprehensive diary. For example, on the 16th of April, I went to sketch the camels on the Suez Canal, about 20 sketches, afternoon to the cattle market, and got sketches of cattle, sheep, goats and a buffalo. Before he left England, William had been persuaded to submit a painting to the Royal Academy of Art for exhibition, an oil painting called Doomed. It was of a buffalo in the snow, surrounded by a pack of attacking wolves. Once nearing home on his return journey, he received a telegram from his brother-in-law that just said, Doomed accepted. The painting sold on the first day of the London exhibition to the MP Alexander Staveley Hill for the grand sum of £40. William also had two more paintings accepted for the Royal Academy in 1896 and 1911, and they were both oils with similar macabre subjects. One, wolves and wild boar, and the other, vanquished. A dead or dying moose lies on the ground as his victorious rival stands over him. Woodhouse seemed happy with life in the northwest. He exhibited widely in the region. He was fortunate to have a champion in the art critic and curator of the Harris Museum in Preston, Sidney Pavier, who said of his work, Good pictures are like good wine, need no praise, let them speak for themselves. The Harris in Preston, Lancaster Story Institute and the City Museum all showed exhibitions of his work and obtained examples for their own collections. To help us picture William in his natural habitat, we asked what Morecambe and Heesham were like during his lifetime. William saw a great, a great change in his lifetime, from three small fishing villages to Morecambe as a thriving holiday resort. With the coming of the railway to Morecambe, combined with the workers in industrial towns receiving holiday pay for the first time, Wakes Weeks were when the factories in one of the towns would close, and Morecambe saw a regular influx of holiday makers from different Lancashire and Yorkshire towns. At one time, Morecambe was referred to as Bradford by the Sea. An early painting of William shows his house kennel coat in the distance across wheat fields and a farmer scything in the foreground. This was soon to be housing. He also captured images of the fishermen and fishing traditions before the invasion of the holiday maker. But William embraced the tourism and again painted what he saw in his beloved Morecambe. There are a number of beach scenes a favourite being donkeys on the beach. Lancaster Maritime Museum having an especially fine example called Donkey Boys. Another favourite of Williams was the stone jetty where Ward's shipbreakers were situated and he recorded a number of the ships broken up at the yard. A tall ship named Akbar appears on many of his sketches and paintings. 
It's hard to picture the now beautiful setting of the stone jetty as a heavy industrial breakers yard. Although this too appeared to be a tourist attraction and visitors would pay for a closer view. Winnie had a beautiful bedhead that I think was probably obtained off one of these liners at Ward's. And William decorated it with paintings of flowers and birds. This also in the museum collection. Well, when my daughter was born, I took her to show Winnie and she was in this bed with the, the ornate bedhead. I put Sally in her arms and said, could I take a photograph? And uh, she said, you only want to uh, take a picture of the bedhead, don't you? William's earlier paintings had been mainly in oil, but watercolours were now becoming more popular and he painted many of the area's picturesque views, particularly Hesham Village. I suspect these were far more affordable for the growing tourist market. Paul knew Winnie and Ronald well and told us a little bit about them as he knew them. In 1981, the then museum curator, Mrs Edith Tyson, curated an exhibition of the work of William and his son, Ronald. It was my very good fortune to go to Auburn to meet Roy and Winnie and be able to choose family paintings to display in the exhibition. This sparked a very special relationship for me with Winnie. I counted myself very lucky to call her that, as good friends of hers that had known her for many years still called her Miss Woodhouse. Both Roy and Winnie's roots and values were very much from an earlier time. On greeting a lady he knew in the street, Roy would often doff his dear stalker hat. I never saw them together. Winnie lived downstairs and Roy upstairs. Firstly, I'd visit Winnie and we would have tea and chocolate marshmallow biscuits from Marks and Spencer. She was always interested, if not approving, of modern trends and very inquisitive of what it was like if I'd had an Indian or Chinese meal. After our chats, she would stand at the bottom of the stairs and shout at the top of her voice for Roy, who was very deaf, and I would go upstairs and have a chat with him. Roy always saw this as an excuse to get a whisky out. Unfortunately, not my favourite tipple, and I spent many years forcing it down with a smile on my face. The house, like its occupants, were of early days. Dark furniture, mostly with carved decoration, all done by William. In the large spacious hall was a settle that housed a leopard skin rug, and the walls were lined with William's paintings. The years of William's and Roy's pipe tobacco smoke evident on their surface. There was a tiny little kitchen, again from a Victorian age, to the rear. There was no gas in the house, when he had a great mistrust of gas, and wouldn't have it in the house. Up the grand staircase in Roy's area was a painted frieze of exotic birds, in what I would imagine would have been William and Maria's bedroom. I was once shown to the garage that was to the rear of the house and under Winnie's bedroom. It had a lovely parquet floor and was originally William's studio. There's a lovely photograph of William in front of his easel, surrounded by paintings, and it was lovely to imagine him sat there painting. If you would like to find out more about William Woodhouse, Paul recommends the book Accolade to an Artist, The Life and Work of William Woodhouse, 1857-1939, to 1939, by Pam Corder Birch. But before he left us, he completed his story by telling us a little more about the lives of Winnie and Ronald. Ronald, better known as Roy, uh, he was the youngest of William's children, born in 1897. His early education was just across the road at the Crookley Propriety School for Boys. He went on to the George Fox School, as up near the castle in Lancaster. After leaving school, he worked for a short time in a bank in Windermere. With the outbreak of World War I, he enlisted in 1915, and in May 1916 saw active service as a gunner in the Royal Artillery. In April 1918, he was very badly injured in an explosion that left him partially deaf for the rest of his life. There's an oil painting, done by William, of Roy on the battlefield, having just fired a howitzer gun. After the war, Roy attended the Morecambe School of Art, and in 1931, Roy married Sarah Elsie Rhodes, and they moved to Silverdale. They later moved a number of times, eventually retiring to Bognor Regis, until his wife died in 1961, when he returned to Auburn. Roy didn't make a living from his art, as his father had done, but I think Roy was a far better artist than he thought. He always felt he was living in the shadow of his father's reputation. Winnie was often the subject of her father's paintings. Winnie was educated at Fowle College in Morecambe on the corner of Lord Street and Marine Road. When she took examinations, though, they were taken in the upper room of Lancaster Town Hall, that's now the City Museum. During World War I, she worked in a bank, and in World War II, as a civil servant for the post office. 
and she remained there until 1957. But really, Winnie's wife was mainly dedicated to her father's memory and promoting his work. Winnie never married. I heard stories that she had been engaged to a big game hunter and that her fiancé had died in World War I, but it wasn't a question I was going to ask her. When older, Winnie walked with the aid of a walking frame, and when I went to see her, it had absolutely everything that she could probably want attached to it. Her handbag, magnifying glass, strings, scissors. Well into her 90s, she had a hip replacement, and when I went to see her, she described the operation to me with great enthusiasm. She was conscious throughout, and said it was like a scene from the TV programme MASH, with her blood all over the place. I remember coming into work one morning with a box of cream cakes, as it were customary to do on your birthday, to see a group of worried faces looking at me. They had just learnt that Winnie had died that morning, aged 101. Sad, of course, but also quite nice in a way, because on that day it always reminds me to give her a little thought. Winnie had once read a local paper that after someone had died, the house had been robbed, and she made me promise that once she died, I had to come and take all the paintings in the house down and take them to the museum. But on the day of the funeral, she wanted to lay in her coffin in the front room at Auburn with the paintings back on the walls. I remember taking the paintings back to Auburn and hanging them back on the walls and Winnie watching me from her open coffin, very tight-lipped and looking very cross. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects. We hope you will listen to some other episodes where we use museum objects to sketch out the histories of everything from art to astronomy. 